motivate researchers and students at ICF uh, to propose ideas and participate in projects of cutting edge science at worldwide level. And this occasion, and to inaugurate this series, we have Alexander Dimitiev, who is the head of the Department of Physics at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. And his, uh, um, his area of study is nanophotonics. And in this occasion, he comes to talk to us about nano antennas. I, and I think that's all I'm going to say at the moment, because I don't know why. Yes. <laughs> but thank you very much for visiting yeah. us. Um, as you might know, yesterday we signed a, um, an agreement of understanding between the University of Gothenburg and uh, UNAM, which follows from a uh, um, previous contract that uh, Dr. Remigio and Dr. Juarez had with, um, through a program called Linus Palme, which no longer exists, but at the moment we are trying to continue this interchange of students and staff in order to have um, collaboration with the University of Gothenburg. So thank you, and uh, it's all yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. And yeah, it was a fantastic occasion also to come and sign this agreement, which, well, it, it has a history, but then we believe it will only get bigger and we're going to which is exchanges, double degrees, and master, and only we see the bright future. Uh, but uh, yeah, today I am not in the <laughs> my quality of the official representing University of Gothenburg, but I am just a modest uh, researcher doing nano optics. Uh, so the key word here is optical antennas, nano antennas. I mean, they're directly connected to regular antennas in your cell phones and your TV. It's just that they're smaller, so they matched the wavelength of light. Could be visible light, so from 400 to nanometers. Could be middle infrared, could be near infrared, but something around the size of, so you take a half a wavelength, 200 nanometers. So the, thus, they're called nano antennas. But the, the, the principles, how they function, pretty much de is described by like antenna theory, the classic radio frequency. So they can receive light, they can process light, they can send out light, so on and so forth. And uh, our particular angle of using these antennas is one area is this magnetophotonics, and uh, some others I will highlight, depending on the time, stories uh, in this talk. Uh, first, of course, I would like to thank the collaborators, uh, well, my group, these are just the recent members, any other past members. Then we, of course, coll collaborate around the world. So these uh, results that they're going to show, these are the results of collaborations. People in Sweden, Ala, Umeå, Finland, Aalto University, Laguna in Spain, very Productive many years collaborations with Nanaguna, ITU, Denmark, going across the. So, Gothenburg is the west coast of Sweden. We go to Denmark over the strait. Uh, Radboud is Netherlands, uh, uh, in Italy, IMEC, that's Belgium, Leuven, Politechnique in Paris, and actually some other places, but I just try to select those related to the stories I'm talking about. And of course, the funders. The European Union ran several projects, uh, Swedish funders, which is Family Foundation, Wallenberg, our Science Foundation, also Science Foundation for Sustainable Research, that bring more into energy efficiency questions, into general sustainability and how light can bring the edge. But first, uh, about these more fundamental subjects of this magnetoplasmonics, magnetophotonics. What is that? So there are obviously some magnets involved there and some light, so magnets and photonics. And the basic principles, well, if you're interested, there is a very extensive uh, review that we wrote some years ago called Nanoscale Magnetophotonics, which describes more or less this phenomenon. So it's actually we couple light to a system of uh, that supports, let's say, propagating surface plasmas. So surface plasmas are collective uh, coherent oscillations of electrons in the metal. 
and then uh, light can couple to those oscillations and they become like a confined uh, dipoles or a propagating wave. This is the propagating surface plasmas or localized surface plasmas. And uh, they have the tendency to enhance the electromagnetic field. So if you just shine light, the outcome is a very, very confined light. So you can find it to very sub, sometimes sub wavelengths uh, beam. And uh, the field also, the initial light, when you find those, it enhanced like 100. And you can use it for different things. So nanoplasmonics is, is a huge field. It started something like five years ago, maybe. Even some works were in the 90s. And people use that for optical devices, biosensing. But here, this particular angle of when we combine that with magnetism, what happens? And of course, plasmons, they are the same as light. So they're very fast. And like the frequencies are, you know, terahertz, hundreds of terahertz. And magnetism is very slow, maybe gigahertz at the best. So, you know, hard drives are very slow. Read and write is slow. So how do we combine these things? And there are basically two ways to combine things. First, we can, um, by applying magnetic fields, we can actually tune how the plasmons work. So how they propagate, how they confine. And all of a sudden, you get this like external handle of how these coherent oscillations of electrons work in the materials. For example, here, like an interface, there is a cobalt film in between, it's just gold. The plasmons are running here in this uh, groove. And then by applying external magnetic field, you can actually change the K vector of this propagating plasma. This is schematically shown uh, here. So all of a sudden, you have like a magnetic tunability of light, if you wish. Except that light, of course, is bound to this uh, film. This is not pre-propagating photons, which are notoriously hard to, to, to steer, notoriously hard to influence because they don't want to interact with anything. So here is like one of the ways how you would interact with light, how would you would steer light with magnetism is just to confine that light into transforming it into plasmons. You can build like uh, optical crystals out of the magnetic materials. Again, then you actually tune uh, the reflectance of pre-propagating light, you can tune the polarization, you can um, uh, create this tunable optical isolator. So typically, you know, it's a well-known subject, this magneto-optics. So there are certain materials where you apply magnetic field and they start rotating the polarization of propagating light. And this is how optical isolation works. It means that you rotate polarization when it passes through, and on the way back, it further rotates, and then it cannot pass through anymore, because if you have a cross-polarized uh, filter here, then, and that is actually used in like laser cavities, the, using this non-reciprocity, because the magnetic field breaks the, uh, the reciprocity. And then, and these materials are like macroscopic, massive, so they need to be transparent, uh, like uh, yttrium, uh, uh, these garnets, uh, they need to be transparent and they're not really like well integrated into electronics so they're like a massive bulk of because also the thickness of um, the propagation length, rotation of polarization is connected to the propagation length so they're not like nanoscopic devices so with these magnetoplasmonics uh, or magnetophotonics you can actually explore like graphene and stuff like that and then all of a sudden your optical isolator becomes extremely thin, atomically thin. You can further control sort of just the propagation of light with even just a system of metallic films with the little dots. And lots of other things, like you can control chirality. And actually, it doesn't have to be necessarily metal. So in this review, we also touched upon semiconductors, the silicon, things like magnetic circular dichroism, when you, by applying magnetic field, you can select uh, viral light is transmitted through here. So it's, it's pretty uh, massive field. It also includes like this ultra fast magnetism. And I will show you some examples of what we're doing in that area. This relates to this inverse Faraday effect is that what you sort of create magnetism by light. Circular polarized light, sort of you create the dipoles.
that could be a magnetic vector. So uh, our own contribution to this field all started some 12 years ago or 15 years ago. We were exploring nanostructures of pure nickel, and you know there are like three metallic ferromagnets: cobalt, nickel, and iron. <laughs> Easy choice, and we can make these nanostructures. And of course, they they are magnetic, so ferromagnets, very nicely. The moment we start making nanostructures of them, they become plasmonic, also. because of course there are electrons, and you can drive these electrons with field. So they are sort of the concentrated uh, representation of what magnetoplasmonics is, are the nanostructures of ferromagnets that can, of course, couple light in. Then some weird things happen, like you can control the, the, cur, uh, the carry uh, rotation, like you can control the rotation of this polarization. I mentioned how the optical isolators work. You just rotate polarization, but now applying magnetic field, you can choose which side you rotate that here we've been controlling the propagation of the circularly polarized light so we have a circular polarized light comes in uh, left circular polarized light right right circular polarized light and we have a structures that contain both gold and the nickel so gold is is very well known plasmonic material because uh, noble metals contain a lot of electrons at fermi level you want to go <laughs> the deeper so then it's very easy to engage them. So when light hits these nanostructures, you drive them very easily. Lots of electrons available. Uh, so they are very nice plasmonic materials like gold, uh, all these noble metals, gold, silver, copper, even aluminum. But then we add a little bit of a, a ferromagnetic piece there. So first, the system becomes chiral, actually, because there are different materials. So it becomes like we break the symmetry. And also it becomes magnetically tuned. So all of a sudden, the transmission of chiral light could be tuned, and here actually could be tuned like 100%. So you can select which polarization passes through, right polar, circular polarized or left. Uh, finally, also actually these kind of things could be applied for sensing, because now instead of just measuring um, in the optics, this plasmonic material will just create a peak, like an absorption or scattering peak in the middle of the visible spectrum. It's pretty broad, and then the sensing works in a way that these plasmons are extremely sensitive to the surrounding of the material, and then the peaks are moving, and that's how you know like the proteins are binding there. The COVID-19 sensor could work. So you just look at the moving, but peaks are not very sharp. So how to make them sharp? Instead of we make these things out of ferromagnets, and instead of just tracking a peak, we now track how these polarization rotation crosses zero, for example. So then you create extremely sharp, like a delta function type of uh, peaks. They're not, so th these are measured uh, data. It's just that how this curve of the polarization rotation crosses zero. But then it works also as a plasmonic sensor. And then you shift here would correspond to the binding of protein. And some other stories, yeah, you can control the distance between the two ferromagnetic particles and you can create these perfect rulers. And again, by using this concept of measuring not just the plasma peak, measuring magneto-optical. Yes, but uh, also you probably wonder, how do we make these things? All these nice disks and uh, primers. So it's the method called whole mass colloidal lithography. We developed that back in uh, seven or a bit. You can check the original paper. The idea is that we use colloids, which are polymeric spheres. Then we just drop them on the surface under certain conditions. They assemble into a nice pattern. And then we just transfer that pattern onto the surface of interest. And then we create disks, metal, semiconductor like to create and that i mean it doesn't limit itself in making you know plasma surfaces so it's just a regular method of nanostructuring so you can create lots of nanostructures on the really huge areas uh, we are talking um, six inch wafers at once so it's like 15 centimeters 20 centimeters size so these are not like small samples 
These are huge pieces of glass covered entirely by the nanostructures. And of course, that immediately finds some applications in uh, photovoltaic, where you need the large scale fabrication and where traditional methods fail to have this large capacity. And we've been applying it for sort of beyond the optics here, we are making interoc oscillators, just bottom up, synchronize the magnetic structure, synchronize their. Um, and uh, actually, it's been pretty widespread in other groups. So these are not our works, actually. People are using it to create these metamaterials, sensors. Uh, yeah, these are mostly hydrogen sensors. So actually, it's a sort of a universal method of, and actually, you don't need a clean room for that. You just need a wet bench and eventual evaporator of some materials that you want to transfer in. We do it in a clean room because it's a nice controlled environment. It doesn't have to be. Please uh, feel free to check that method and you could actually adopt it. Uh, so so you, you don't need just to create nanostructures. You can structure the surfaces with this method. And here are some examples of how we working with the silicon solar cells. For example, polycrystalline with a lots of roughnesses, we just create like a tonic structure on top of this roughness. This is like two micrometer steps. I mean, polycrystalline silicon is, is very bad surface. Then on top of that, we create this perfect uh, tonic structuring to capture more light. We even can, I uh, hear it's hard to see, but these are these uh, pyramids, you know, crystalline silicon to uh, create, to reduce the, it's like anti-reflecting coating to reduce the reflection, uh, you create this, uh, I mean, it's a well-etched uh, silicon surface, but then on top of these uh, pyramids, which are, I mean, they're pretty high, five micrometers and above, we create this extra layer of nano holes all over, so then further you can increase the capacity of these uh, cells to absorb the light. Here we did the also some work on ultra-thin crystalline silicon solar cells. So this total thickness here is one micron. We start with one micron uh, sheet of crystalline silicon. And then since we make these holes, the, effect, the effective um, thickness becomes like 800 nanometers or 700 nanometers. So it's like, that's why we call it sunlight thin. So we are basically at the wavelength of sunlight. And this has, well, pretty decent efficiency considering the amount of material. And uh, surprisingly enough, these uh, pretty uh, drastic, uh, dramatic structuring doesn't alter the electronic properties, so we do not create extra um, charge trapping. Um, it's not always you want to make your structures on the flat surfaces. You can probably in some applications, you need to structure really weird surfaces and not necessarily even those that you can bring into the evaporation chamber. But these, for these needs, we create the method of transferring the structure to basically any surface of choice. Uh, we use this uh, thin carbon films. You create a nanostructure on top of this film. It could be E-beam, could be, again, colloidal lithography, wherever you want, like any kind of nanostructure lithographically fabricated, and then through the uh, lift off and um, pick up method, we can actually deposit them on virtually any crazy substrates that you would think of. These are examples of putting that. This is just glass. You see the color, these are the so these gold disks. This is just a simple uh, system of gold disks on top of these carbon films, and we then drop it on different surfaces. This is glass. This is actually a PDMS. Uh, this is a fluidics uh, system. So it's the, the polymer you etch the channels that you use for high sensing. Different things. And then you can actually structure these uh, channels with the optical biosensing, essentially. You just give the capacity to this channel to sense whatever is passing through. Here are some examples of just depositing this. Uh, so this SEM, you don't see the uh, carbon film underneath, so it looks like 
so disks just floating over. But we just drop that onto a collection of uh, and more <laughs> fancy examples is that you can actually have this standalone 20 nanometer films perforated with these holes. So this is just a gold film standalone. Then you can wrap it around wherever you want, it becomes like a film. And on top of that, it actually has the opt optical functionality because, of course, you have the holes that support these. Plasmons and presence. Uh, what, uh, last example is wrapping the yeast cells <laughs> into these <laughs> films. This is work done at Stan. Uh, we add cells though, then we sort of completely wrap them around. The idea was to sort of happening on the surface of the cells because we essentially wrap the cells with the biological sensors, biosensors. That is disks that you can just probe by measuring the reflectance. Yes, but now to the more recent results, how do we use this method to go into combining ferromagnets and uh, now this pulsed light? And the idea is actually creating next generation hard drives, which would be as fast as the light pulses. But of course, they also need to be as dense as the current hard drives, this is a pretty uh, big challenge because industry is really, really good having high density of the on your um, in, in the in the memory uh, device. So we then thought, why don't we use these plasmons and use this a bit of a fancier nanostructures, which are these rings with a little hole in the middle? So we want to confine the pulse light, and we want to see can we actually affect the very magnetic film underneath or that work. So uh, the particular thing with these rings is that they actually, I mentioned, typically there is like one resonance, so plasma resonance, indivisible, but the rings of course have two resonances because also like dipoles distribute in a funny way. And then what we actually see is that these are de demagnetization. So we, what we do is like we pulse light into the film and these are the, uh, the turbium cobalt film. This material is well known, say, in the uh, ultra fast demagnetization. So, this is the, like a first step of read and write memory, potentially at very fast scales because the pulses are in the femtosecond. So, what we do, we pulse light into these rings. What we see is that we detect the demagnetization of this film. So normally, uh, Uh, normally, the demagnetization will be actually here. That's like a film. And then what we do now with these holes, the demagnetization becomes less. So you would think that's pretty weird because you have these antennas that concentrate light. You must demagnetize the film much, much better than just the clean film, which experiences the incoming pulse of light. But the trick here is that now we are confining light into these little holes. So before we were just illuminating five micrometer spot all over, the whole film gets demagnetized at this rate. Now all that five micrometers is squeezed into these small little dots. So the effective amount of the material that we demagnetize is reduced very substantially. And actually, this is sort of indirect proof that we indeed take the pulse and now we just squeeze it into 20 nanometer little hole. And that's actually pretty, the, the size there is compatible to these uh, one, terabytes per, one terabytes per square inch. Like this is the aim of having this high density uh, magnetic memory. So it's about the feature size of 20, 25 nanometers. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're just squeezing light into these small uh, little holes. This, we just probe what's happening underneath the surface. This is just the simulations because it's really hard to experimentally prove that, except for looking at demagnetization. Like all of a sudden, wow, we, just, we demagnetize much less material. And we just try to quantify and see how the actual pulse gets. Of course, if you're not on the resonance, nothing really happening. The pulse is actually not squeezing into these little holes, but when you're on the resonance of this disk, you remember these two peaks. So you're sitting on one of these peaks. 
one of the optical resonances, of course, you start actually channeling light into the underlying ferromagnetic. Yeah, so then uh, this is the system of the film and the antennas. And you try to squeeze the light by the antenna, but it's still a film. So these are not magnetic nanostructures. And we're thinking, okay, let's just drop the film, use the same material, but then now combine magnetic antenna, uh, sorry, optical antenna, and these ferromagnetic elements. So like this would be the prototypical memory unit. Now we just structure that into little disks on top of the actual optical antennas, now these are more or less like disks, except that they're slanted the right pyramid. Funny enough, the ferromagnetic film actually keeps its properties, so it has still this uh, perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, so the magnetization needs to look out, up when we structure it, which is in itself is pretty um, interesting observation. But then also we pack them into these uh, crystals, and of course once you start packing optically active antennas into crystals, you start developing this funny lattice resonances. It's not really the resonances of individual nanostructures, they start coupled to each other, so they form a crystal. This is what you see here in this sharp... And of course these features really depend on which angle you come to the structures and the, you know, the more the angle, the more you couple into this uh, sort of propagating uh, lattice resonances. It matches pretty nicely experiments and equations. But of course, it's also a magnetic material, right? So we can measure these uh, curves where we apply magnetic field, we just sweep magnetic field from zero to 400 millitesla, and we <clears throat> look at the ellipticity of the reflected light. I mean, this is how you measure what, ha what is happening to the magnetic material. You just measure the light reflectance and you send in the polarization and you see how it rotates. This is this magneto-optical air effect, a standard method to probe your magnetic structures. But now all of a sudden, depending on the angle, we start reverting these loops, which is this not supposed to be happening. But it's just because we are not working with the film, we are working with a system of little antennas, which are forming these uh, long-range uh, crystals. And then, uh, of course, the optical spectrum becomes very... magneto-optical spectrum becomes very sharp. At, it's like angle-dependent, extremely efficiently. So, actually, here the idea was that then we can actually uh, identify at which angle the original light came into the structure. If you look at uh, different angles and you just sit at these points, you would say, oh, okay, so this light pulse came at doesn't have to be pulses, so it's just the circularly polarized light comes into the structure, and then we say, well, it actually came at 15 degrees incidence, which is pretty tricky. Like, you know, for the detector cannot do that. You cannot de detect at which angle the light came to the system. For the detector, just detects the photons, it absorbs and transforms it into electrical signal. Now we have this uh, little bit of a capacity of angular vision, just one of the concepts. Then we keep looking at these uh, crystals, and now we try to sort of look at the demagnetization, how the demagnetization happens in these little uh, disks. So before you saw how the demagnetization is happening in the big fill. We get pulsed here, we also pulse with light, and we look at off-resonance case and on-resonance case. And then, of course, um, yeah, so you really need to compare similar fluences and the peaks would be... So it's not like you compare this and this one. So these triangles need to be compared with the spheres. So of course, when you pump on the resonance, you start to demagnetize much more. So this is the original of resonance, as though there's just a film. No plasmons, nothing. Light is not getting squeezed. Structure. But we're sitting on these... Uh, particular surface resonances. So we're not actually hitting the individual disciples. We're not hitting the individual antennas. Instead, we're trying to couple into this, uh, this surface lattice resonances, which are only possible because we have these kind of crystals. And of course, on the resonance, we actually have a normal like plasma enhancement. Uh, and off resonance, yeah, we poorly... Um, we do not excite them. 
But here it really depends on the direction of the crystal where we hit it. So if we do not hit the surface uh, uh, lattice resonance, these are just plasmons. Not excite at certain distances between the disks, there is no propagating mode. But if there is a correct excitation and there is a correct mode excited, then we actually hit these instead of just hitting the plasmons, we're also hitting this propagating surface uh, mode. And what it turns out is that, of course, yeah, the surface mode depends on the angle, and then it turns out that the demagnetization becomes dependent also on the angle. So normally how these systems work, you pulse, you demagnetize, work done. The next step is like to remagnetize and so on and so forth. So it's like really you fully magnetized or fully demagnetized. But now, because we have not just the plasmons, we're not just enhancing the rate of demagnetization, but we are trying to move, like the intensity actually we're moving from these ferromagnetic disk a little bit down, because depending on the angle we can now sort of tune where do we hit uh, these surface uh, resonances. And it turns out that we actually can control the degree of demagnetization. So instead of having fully magnetized, fully demagnetized, we start hitting this intermediate state, which we control with the angle of incidence. Well, we, in this paper, we were fantasizing about some neuromorphic functionality, so because we have like intermediate states and they're based only at femtosecond time, so you have like a instantaneous uh, memory of the angle that the light came into into the structure. That was the idea that uh, some intermediate states, which one could say, well, it's just that you're poorly magnetizing the structure. But uh, you can also turn it around thinking, well, but actually, intermediate states could be used for something. Like the brain uses uh, intermediate states to process information. So now, OK, I have uh, some time left. I don't know when, when did we start. Maybe five. But... 10, 15 minutes, okay. So now there are a bit of a two decoupled stories which are very, very recent. Uh, one is about coupled oscillators. And you will see the connection to the magnetism and, uh, and plasmonics. This is just a normal system, exists in mechanics. If you have two oscillators and they are coupled, at some point they would uh, experience this um, formation of the intermediate state, uh, which then you know, when instead of just uh, oscillating independently, they start oscillating like this or like that. Two states are forming all of a sudden. And that is true also for mechanics, also true for uh, light. And it would depend on the coupling constant. The, the moment coupling constant is a certain value, you, you form this like strongly coupled system. Instead of being two random oscillators, start really uh, oscillate together. Well, not that surprisingly, as I mentioned, that things exist also for light. Now, these are not mechanical oscillators, but these are the optical oscillators. And the thing is that you now couple, instead of two oscillators, you use one, a molecular transition, so the transition, electronic transition in the molecule, back and forth, absorption, the, then recovery. And then you can have uh, like a uh, optical resonator where the molecule is sitting and then all of a sudden these two they first they should have exactly the same energy and then they should be collocated in space and some conditions on dipole orientation but the most important thing is that they start forming these two states molecular resonance couples to a optical cavity the cool thing about it is that all of a sudden you lower the energy of the molecular transition. So if you want to do like photochemistry, and before you needed to supply that amount of energy, all of a sudden now you need to supply only this amount. And that the whole field exploded about 2012 uh, with uh, Thomas Abison making this um, seminal work on running the chemistry, which is then is called polaritonic chemistry. So these new two states are called polaritons. You have first a cavity, then you have molecular transition, they couple, and each of these states is like hybrid. There's a bit of a cavity and a little bit of a molecular um, transition. 
So they have like feature of both, but effectively what they do is that they make photochemistry run easier. That also works for vibrational excitation. So you can also do that with a single molecule in this, so that, that would form like an optical cavity. You have a gold structure, you have a gold film, you come close enough, the light would be confining here. So cavity doesn't have to be like a physical box. It's just the light intensity that couples in. And then the moment you are man managing to uh, put in a, a molecule, exactly that happens. So they split, you form polaritons. Original resonance, and two new polaritons, and here is this avoided crossing polaritons. So here, exactly how I showed it for uh, mechanical oscillators. So now this is extremely active field right now of coupling molecules to the cavities, as I mentioned, because you know chemistry is involved. Uh, we looked a little bit into that direction by looking at the antenna now. So we love optical antennas. And now we... You mean here? Uh, yeah, it depends on lots of factors. Uh, it's probably also a little bit of a background. But yeah, actually lower and higher polaritons could have a different intensity. They don't have to be the same. It depends on the system, depends on how they couple. Yes, so what we do, we take, instead of having the cavity like that, just... Uh, the actual gap between two structures, we form that by this light intensity at the tip of the antenna. Because it's the same kind of way of confining light. You create a strong electromagnetic field, which then you consider as a cavity. Okay? And then we put uh, antennas, uh, sorry, molecules all over. It's actually exactly the same molecules that I used here in seminal works. So we just put them all over that. This very simple system is very open. It's at room temperature. Everything is very simple. And then we just pulse the light into the system. And the idea was actually to, uh, to explore how in time the polaritons evolve. What, what really is happening to them? Because we form this kind of polaritons here. Also, the antenna is anisotropic. So we only form polaritons at these tips because of the matching of the resonance to the molecular absorption, whereas the narrower side of the antenna, marked in blue, they do not strongly couple them. Actually, this is a way for us to look at the uncoupled system at the same time with the same system, just pulsing perpendicularly to the... So these are these antennas, uh, these are these molecules from uh, the seminal studies. This is just a photo transition between spiropiran and... Uh, Merosinin, yeah, spiropiran and merosinin. Classic system of how you can go from UV absorbing molecule into visible absorbing molecule. So note that it's photon energy, so it's sort of reversed. The longer wavelength is here. You can have this transition, and all of a sudden you form this really nice um, molecular resonances. And this one just appears when we transit from one form to another. It's a change of chemical structure that results in in the spectrum. So what we do here, we have these molecules all over, we have the anisotropic antennas, we pulse them along the long axis and along the short axis. They, of course, form the polaritons, lower polariton, upper polariton, again, not the same intensity. So that it's, I think it's more common that it has a diff the lower polariton and upper polariton. Uh, we probe them with the uh, ultra-fast uh, pumping. So actually, I mean, they look pretty normal. So here, right here, there is no breakthrough science. We just look at how the states evolve simultaneously. And also, of course, we're looking at non-coupled system. You see here, there's actually just a superposition of a plasma peak and the molecular peak. So no coupling here, strong coupling here. Very different time scales. But what actually, it turns out that by pumping, we destroy the strong coupling. A lot of people looking the systems where they want to study the time evolution, exactly how we thought from the beginning. Time evolution of the strongly coupled system, because it's important for chemistry, because it's important, it's like fundamental questions, how these strongly coupled systems work. But instead, what we uh, discovered that 
just by pumping, we immediately go to like a pure molecular. So strong couple, strongly coupling, strong coupling is gone. The one should be extremely careful of studying this system, especially the molecules coupled to the antennas. So you need to really monitor what you're looking at, because actually you just transform your strongly coupled system to the uncoupled system very easily. That's the main message of this paper. Now, the funny part is that, of course, we work with magnetic nanostructure, right? Nickel, for example. And then nickel is particular, so no molecules here, but nickel actually has the interband transition. So it's kind of a, like a molecular transition. Electrons are shot, shuffled between uh, the bands. It happens at 4.6 EV. You can actually see that in, you know, in the, you measure the film, you see that peak in absorption. But in the previous works I showed, well, we know that nickel has also these plasmons. Now we have, instead of having molecular resonance and the cavity, now we have like a plasmon resonance and the absorptive intrinsic interband transition in nickel. Kind of two oscillators, you would think. Which is it's like a weird thing, really. Like you couple to the intrinsic transition in the material. But do, you, do you really? Of course, we can change the size of these nickel antennas and we can move these peaks back and forth. And it turns out that we exactly form which looks like a strongly coupled system. So can you imagine, there is this plasma resonance. It's a nickel disk, electrons are moving, and then the same electrons are experiencing the interband transition. And then we all of a sudden, we bring the resonance of a plasmon to the wavelength of the interband transition, and they start coupling strongly. What does that mean, really, in practice? What, it, it means the same as it meant for the molecular system. They form these polaritons that are now half electronic oscillation and half electronic absorption. How is that even possible? Because, you know, electronic oscillations should be destroyed by the electronic absorption because, you know, you take out the electrons. Because you absorb light, the electron starts engaging into interband transition instead of engaging into the plasma. But it's not what they're doing. They're really coupling together and then, you know, it could be that all of a sudden, because the plasma, you know, extends outside the structure, because the field is outside the structure. But of course, interband only where the material is, right? Only inside the structure. But if we form this kind of a polaritonic dipoles, which is a mix of electron absorption and um, plasma oscillation, what well, now we have like absorption outside of the material? That even be? There is no answer. I cannot provide you an answer. But it's just, you know, thinking creatively, what, what could that be? And of course, back then, I mean, it was 2014, it's pretty much like the same time when the strong coupling started to evolve. And we didn't have the tools to really understand what, what is happening there. So we went further very recently to look with the electron microscope with EELS, it's the electron loss microscopy, uh, to look at the films, to look at the nanostructures. And we see exactly the same thing. So we see how interband transition uh, couples to dipolar plasmons. It actually couples to quadrupolar plasmons, hexapole, so higher modes, because the dipole is this, quadrupole is this. And it only matters at which wavelength this hexapole happens. And it depends on the size of the structure. So we can bring these multipolar resonances into the interband, and they also start coupling. And it also happens in, in the films. So lots of open questions. We're trying to look at the system with the ultra-fast uh, spectroscopy. Prove, well, these are real polaritons. And the nature of polaritons. How can it be that the uh, electronic absorption at the same time is the electronic oscillation here in the electronic oscillation? Yeah, a bit of an open question. Yeah, this, I don't know, maybe... Uh, this might take maybe five minutes. Good. It's good, yeah. <laughs> because here you have to reset your mind again. So forget about strong coupling. Uh, do not forget about ferromagnets and nine structures. So our very recent, uh, very recent um, uh, ideas revolve around building a, what is called a telegon uh, material. Alternative name is mag magnetoelectric materials. 
So what, what is that? What is that? Especially non-reciprocal. Normal materials, of course, they interact with the light, with the permittivity. Absolutely. And then metamaterials is those materials that, because, you know, the magnetic part of light really does not interact with materials. Only the electric part of light interacts. But then, of course, metamaterials came 20 years ago. You started creating magnetic dipoles that oscillate with the frequency of light and then all of a sudden the incoming light then starts filling these dipoles and then you start engaging the permeability so normally permeability is one so there is no interaction of magnetic part of light with the with the structure it could be non structure just the material but now it could deviate from one the moment you start engaging this uh, metamaterials okay well established then there is another concept which called called bioanisotropy is that you can create a magnetization by the electric field or the polarization by the magnetic component. That is also a well-established uh, notion that one can drive another. Then uh, the reciprocal by an is the chirality. You know, the chiral material, so you have this uh, symmetry. This is actually one of those recipro reciprocal by an So the parity symmetry is broken, the symmetry is broken. But the time symmetry holds, so you go back and forth, it's the same type of reality. You do not change the hand that is just by going through material once and returning, it's the same chirality. It's like a right-handed or left-handed. It doesn't matter how you come to it. That's reciprocity. But then these funny guys, the telegon material is like the ultimate <laughs> complexity. It's also non-reciprocal. So you break both time symmetry and the parity symmetry. That's when it becomes Magnetoelectric, alternative name is magnetochiral or telegon. So both symmetries are broken. What does it mean in practice? Um, just a little bit of history also that uh, they were concealed by electrical engineer as the gyrator. That like back in 49, they thought of it as like a fifth element of the electrical, of the electrical circuitry. Uh, so that's from the electrical engineering perspective that you would think is like a magnet which is stuck to an electrical dipole. And the idea is that the external electric field could orient the electrical dipole, and then the magnets will also change. So then it will kind of affect the magnetic field back, even in a static case. So it's like a, think of a electrically polarizable dipole and a magnet just stuck into it. Once you start moving one, the other also moves, so you have a, like a feedback loop. In physics, that's been conceptualized by Landau and also uh, by Jelashinsky. He found uh, the effect in chromium oxide at cryogenic temperatures. And then for, actually from this, the uh, whole multiferroic and ferroelectric ferromagnets uh, field developed. And these are the um, relation of the, uh, the uh, flux and uh, the uh, field. Magnetic field, magnetic flux, um, electric field, and the uh, displacement. Yeah, exactly. So uh, normally you would know this part, electromagnetism, like classical electromagnetism. Of course, the uh, magnetic field through the uh, permeability connects to the magnetic. But then actually the real expression of the, the most complex case there is a chirality entering, and then there is this telegon parameter entering. And as I said, the concept is like you can influence the electricity by magnetic field and the magnetic field by the electricity. This is what these relations really tell you. So this is how the materials actually that exist in the real world classify. So you have a parity and you have a reciprocity. So magneto-optics, I mentioned before, they, they actually break the reciprocity. You know, you rotate polarization here, you come back, it keeps on rotating, so there is no reciprocity there. But of course, there is an applied magnetic field. This is what breaks the symmetry. Same with the um, just normal magnets. Now, chiral materials, I also mentioned the, the broken parity, but it's a, it's a reciprocal. So time is reciprocal there, but now he of course choose the most complicated case. And the excited thing about it is like they do not exist in the optical frequency. Those materials predicted by Landau, Jeloshinsky, 
at the best microwaves. So there is no materials that behave in this way for the visible light. Until now. <laughs> that is. What would be the consequences of actually having that with the visible light? You would actually have um, a true one-way transmittance. So the glass would be absolutely black from one side and fully transparent from the other side. It would be pretty cool, huh? It's not, just, it's not enough just having a telegon material for that. You also need like some layered structure, some, some chiral materials. But I mean, that would exactly this breaking of uh, reciprocity would actually enable that. Another thing, of course, we have a cosmologist in the audience. So the equations that describe the telegon are the same as uh, describing the axions. And how would you experimentally probe the dark matter in axions? Well, there's probably no way to do that, but all of a sudden you would have like a tabletop experiment just using light and the telegon material to predict how, you know, the, the dark matter is behaving in, in cosmos. That's why, I mean, the hunt for these materials was strong for the past 50 years. So now what we do this work we just theoretically conceptualize how could they be built and there are some approaches how you could build them but then you need like individually magnetized so like technologically it's and is unfeasible to make them now we try to create a system where it becomes technologically feasible and what we do we use a optical resonator it's just the like a silicon disc high um, epsilon uh, disc which supports this kind of, uh, well, forget that it's magnetic, it's just like a mid-type resonance. It's not plasmonic, but it's kind of similar. So it's like an optical resonance in the disk. And then we use our favorite ferromagnetic particles. And this, uh, in this example, is just cobalt. So we have external field. How does it work? So cobalt would have these spontaneous magnetization. It's just a little disk, which is always magnetized out of plane. It's similar to this turbulent cobalt that I showed before. So however you orient, it always will have this spontaneous magnetization. We don't need even to magnetize it. So we shine light on this thing. We create, because of the magnetic field, we sort of start turning this, but you know, like a Lorentz force. The applied magnetic field is not applied, it's just a natural magnetic field in the structure. And we start creating this uh, torque uh, optical um, electric field that now points 90 degrees towards us. That actually creates like non-diagonal elements in the dielectric function of this material. That's actually this how magnetopics works. And then of course, well, you have a dipole here, it starts creating like a circular uh, magnetic flux around the dipole, right? But then also we have a resonance here which is able to con sort of confine that and is welcoming this kind of circular flux and creating now a stable magnetic dipole at optical frequency. So it's the same frequency as the incoming electromagnetic wave, visible light, except that now we also have in-phase uh, magnetic dipole parallel to the original field that we shine on the structure. This is very unusual. Typically, you have 80 degrees. Now we have these two dipoles working together. And it turns out that exactly creates reasonably high telegon uh, coefficient. This, high. this is just to, to show how the magnetic resonance works. You have a flux, then you have a... It's like a magnetic field of light. It's not really a magnetism. Magnet, so this is how we propose the constituent of the telegon matter should look like. Silicon here, cobalt here. It's exactly the same uh, system that I showed you, creating eventually this magnetic moment out of the oscillating electric field together. We can also imagine that these kind of disks could be randomized, so it becomes really isotropic. That is very important to have this material not having extra anisotropy. Then uh, all other coupling are vanishing because we also it becomes tunable because of course we can change the size of these disks. Like all these resonances are extremely tunable. 
Then we measure, uh, we, uh, sorry, not yet. So we uh, theoretically calculate what are the permittivities, permeabilities, and then we extract this chi, real and imaginary. It already shows at room temperature 100 times more than this chromium measured by angel so this is the start uh, of course having these nanofabrication methods at hand next step is we're actually making these things we're making it surface format first they're just sitting on the surface and then we're also making them in the volume so there will be like a slab of the material that potentially can form dark transparent glass so that's the next step but first we just try to theoretically imagine how that would work in something that is doable experimentally. Because we are actually experimentalists. Very important. Okay, finally, the summary of all this uh, pile of knowledge that I poured onto you. Optical antennas, important, very powerful tool. Very easy to make also. You don't need a clean room to make them. Uh, you can... Uh, Look at the magnetism, you can look at ultra-fast uh, light pumping, you can look at molecular systems. Uh, you can see how light couples into these antennas in a very weird way. Or maybe you can create a system to study dark matter. I thank you for your attention. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Now we'll go for the question. First question. Sure. Question. But throughout the presentation, I saw about the gold and nickel, right? Yeah. Spherical nanoparticles. Do you think well, they're discs. Discs. Yeah. Do you think that there is any problem with the shape, size, uh, surface chemistry? It's surprisingly not, because of course you yeah, would think nickel oxidizes, right? So uh, cobalt also oxidizes. So you would think, you make these nanostructures, you put them on the shelf in like two months, they should be substantially oxidized. And of course, that would affect, you know, plasma and resonances. It doesn't happen. I think it's because of the confinement to the nanostructures. Like you kind of hinder the oxidation. So we don't really, the samples live forever, basically. These nickel nanodisks, cobalt nanodisks. We were really surprised to... Discover that. That's that, is, that is very beautiful. Hmm? Because generally, I face the problem, right, with oxidation. So generally, we work. Well, potentially, that's what we thought. You know, these samples should be really short-lived, because we are working in nothing cryogenic, nothing. Uh, but these uh, discs do not behave as film. The films would be, of course, they change magnetic property. Everything follows. Here we have the same plasma resonance, the same. Optimization loop. You change the shape star uh, some other. Tube. Well, the, the the good thing that we're not going into stars. We're not going into these very fancy shaped materials. We work with like rings, discs. I mean, all, like stacks of. They're pretty robust. There are no sharp features, so we do not rely on like extreme field enhancement. Because of course, these these stars would be really good at confining light. You would be good at creating extremely high highly intense spots of electromagnetic field. But we don't do that. I mean, of course, the enhancement there would be like 100 times in these dipoles, in these the cavities that we show. The enhancement are not extreme. Well, good enough to create strong coupling, for example. Another thing, these nanoparticles are individually attached or atomic arrangement, gold and nickel? They're all amorphous. Amorphous, huh? They are, it's like the most basic... That's why I'm saying you don't need a clean room. You just make the, uh, the uh, sort of the pattern and then you just deposit with the normal, whatever, E-beam deposition, you know, standard chambers. Like you hit your target with electrons, it warms up, the material flies, and you just form amorphous metal disc. So there is no control of the structure at the atomic level. They're just... Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, this uh, whole mass colloidal lithography. Yeah. So whether we need the same kind of mass like in photolithography, and we are supposed to drop the colloid 
colloidal solution top on the top of the mask how it works uh, yeah it need- as much as i didn't have even time to go into detail it's actually it's very simple so you have a surface you spin a, a pmma layer like a normal resist then on top you put a colloidal solution it needs to be charged and also you pre-charge this pmma layer on top so like the particles when they land first they stick particles have a positive uh, charge on the surface you charge it negatively so they stick but then the next one comes and it, the one that already landed create like a forbidden zone around it so they do not land on each other and they do not land next to each other but because of the electrostatic repulsion they just land with a certain distance and these kind of uh, amorphous looking distribution which has a very sharp uh, radial distribution function so there is a very nice peak of the nearest neighbor distance that is purely defined by electrostatics so how they land this one could be the next one next one and that happens like massively within one uh, 20 seconds of when you drop the solution poof, the entire surface gets uh, sampled there's a highly parallel process which you don't even have to control what you can control is the charges of these uh, particles you can reduce the charge then they will land closer Raise the charge then further apart but then okay how do we actually make the structures out of this these are just colloidal spheres so then on top we deposit a mask thus whole mask colloidal lithography is like a chromium film 10 nanometer chromium film then we tape strip the spheres and you have a chromium film with these holes where the spheres were previously sitting and then pmma on the bottom and then you just edge through all the way to your substrate and now you have openings at your substrate where the spheres were assembled and then through these openings you then deposit gold silver nickel cobalt whatever you want silicon any material that you can evaporate goes into these holes and then you just remove them made by no need of a clean room to room. need of a clean room to for this technique I no absolutely not it's just a uh, what we do of course yeah deposit pma yeah you just need a spinner okay yeah a spinner it's just the, these are water-based solutions. The colloids, you just buy them, drop them, they assemble, you wash them with water, you lift off your yeah, acetone, you put, dip it into acetone. So the only thing you need is really the, uh, the deposition system. Like this is the most uh, expensive and complicated part, but it really depends on the system you want to work with. It's just metals, simpler, maybe like a sputtering system that's more complicated. That's not like a nice. Otherwise, no, no cleaner. The wet bench. Yeah, thank you. Important. You talk about um, quantum emitters coupled to particles. Yeah, uh, not really, but well, continue. The, 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 <laughs> the polaritons, right? Uh, is there any interest um, in coupling quantum emitters polaritons? French, elegant. <laughs> yeah, so it's not enough complicated. Let's add the strong coupling to the mix. Well, surely the thing is that it's really it's more like non-resonant. So the telegon material, like we actually try to avoid having resonances there. What we have is just a mode. So the mode of the silicon disk, which is it's like it's available mode. We don't really excite that. So we just want it to be there so the magnetic flux can be settled on that mode. And thus we will have this dipole. Because the effective dipole actually, here I didn't stress that. So this is the effective magnetic dipole. You see it actually emerges not in the middle of the disk, but like at the interface because it's sort of like a hybrid. But we don't really want to excite this resonance. It would be too much. We just want it to be available somewhere here so that we can deposit this dipole on top of that resonance so you know it, it is more pronounced then uh, actually then the effect becomes detectable but otherwise yeah i mean adding the resonant feature probably not at this stage but yeah questions First of all, I, I agree with your discussion about getting a pile of knowledge. 
It was a very nice pilot, pilot moment. Well, yeah. I had to, you know, it's my first time in Mexico. I had to tell you everything. So at the very bottom of this pile, a very basic question. Yep. This uh, model of uh, plasma treatment, by very basic yep. knowledge, uh, in the free electron model, you have a dependency upon density of charges and mm -hmm. temperature. Is there a simple way to add the magnetic field? If you know. No, because they are completely different uh, wavelengths or well frequency. Like the the difference in frequency is like ten thousand times. The magnetism is slow, and these uh, you know plasma oscillations are well. Let's say like I mentioned, four hundred terahertz versus one gigahertz. I I think they're completely invisible for each other, unless you start sort of coupling them into one structure. And I mean, magnetism doesn't become fast just because we magnetize nickel disk. It's the same slow magnetism. It's just that because we coupled these plasma oscillations that become surface plasmons, because we confine the plasma into the nanostructure. So again, we start with the plasma and metals, but this is at much higher energies. Because we squeeze that in, the energy comes into the visible range. Now we can work with that. So instead of like 5 EV, we go to 2 EV. Okay, we work with the vis visible light. But then what do we do with the magnetism? It's like really indirect effect. How do you control these resonances by the magnetism? Yeah, you can change the propagating K vector. Or if the structure is already magneto-optic, you can start influencing this tensor, the epsilon there. Because it's already kind of changing, you get these non-diagonal elements and you start working with the standard. So it's not like, there's no easy way to influence one by another just because there's a huge distance in frequency. This, this, the whole story was actually about <laughs> closing that gap. How can you influence something that is super slow by something that is super fast and vice versa? I'm allowed to continue with these basic questions. Yeah. This, this uh, effect you mentioned at the beginning that you can affect the reflectance with magnetic. Yeah. Again, I have this very naive, you know, Fresnel <laughs> approach of yeah. uh, boundary conditions of the uh, actual equations. Yes. Can you explain this effect with this simple? You work with polarizations. You don't really affect the intensity of the reflected light, but you control how the polarization is. You know, it becomes from linear to become elliptical, or how it is rotated. This is what you control. You don't really control, you know, the photons. How much do you reflect? How much you trans? Because the, you know, polarization control is actually intrinsic for this magneto-optical materials already. So static magnetic field influences the tensor, which defines how light interacts with the material. And once we have these. Uh, entrance to the optical property through making the standards are non-diagonal. So we create these extra terms which are magnetic field dependent. This is how you enter into optics through the magnetism. But this is still like a static magnetism. And of course, yeah, you don't influence photons. You just influence, for example, polarization state. Nice talk. Um, being a theorist, I, my question is more into uh, how do you foresee the applications of this new antenna? Well, there is plenty of applications already now. I mean, the simplest one is actually your pregnancy test and the COVID test. The colors actually come from plasma. Uh, it, I mean, it's very simple because they create color. I mean, plasmons, actually, the color of the plasma is the color of your stained windows. How do the stained windows keep the color for 500 years? It's because there are metal particles, there are like a silver colloidal particles inside the glass that sustain plasma resonances, and thus the red color, thus the blue color. It depends on the size of this particle. And it never fades. Well, because they're embedded in glass, so they don't oxidize. So all this kind of biosensing, like a colorimetric detection, that's already happening. It's happening on like a simple things like just having a, mar a plasma marker on your COVID test or a pregnancy test. It's like the plasma doesn't really 
do anything except for providing a color and just seeding these nanoparticles because they again they do not degrade so it's very easy to use but of course i mean biosensing in the sense that you have a plasmon disc plasmon antenna that is sensitive to the surrounding what could be the surrounding binding of the proteins that's also a very straightforward application i mean spr sensing there's a commercial machines so they don't use nanostructures they use films those propagating plasma localized and whatever you bind there of course yeah, you get immediate response is does the <laughs> it can of course yeah of course you can uh, put in uh, orbital momentum you can create like all these um, exactly structured light all these fancy things exactly plasmonics also it's more like you go into meta surfaces so meta surfaces do not have to be necessarily plasmonic i mean the thing with plasmonics is that you also lose a lot of light so there's a lot of absorption it's not just scattering fancy colors you know you probably lose like 60 percent of light which is not very good for optical devices and uh, for example creating these complex uh, like polarization plates so for that you actually rather use this me resonances exactly this type they're basically non-absorbing. So the only absorption here happening is because of silicon, and you absorb a little bit uh, as a nanostructure because the amount of material is limited. So then this kind of playing with nano antennas, but the, like I mentioned, nano antennas do not have to be metallic. They be made out of semiconductor. It really depends how you shape them and where is the resonance. Then for that, you can actually create a very complex elements and right now there is a company making uh, lenses for like your cell phones which are flat so all of a sudden because of these antennas you can combine them in a fancy way build these metal surfaces your optical elements become 200 nanometers thin instead of being a bulky lens <coughs> so that is straightforward application of that thank you more questions, please. Thank you. And thinking about the uh, light matter coupling, uh, in these structures, you can reach uh, deep, strong coupling, structure, I don't know, uh, virtual photon. I mean in the, in the resonator, in the cavity. Yes. What, uh, what was the question? Sorry. I... Uh, you can reach the, these regimes of ultra deep stone coupling where, uh, I don't know, these effects are present. The emergence of, of, of virtual photons. I think it's with these uh, antennas, <laughs> especially these um, where you have strong coupling of the interband. You know that the splitting between these two modes, when we form a coupled state, like 1.3 electron volts. Normally in molecular systems is like milli electron volts. So the coupling here is absolutely huge. It's like two orders of magnitude stronger than when molecule is coupling to a cavity. What is the consequence for the physics? We don't know yet. But we're going to look into that with the ultrafast, trying to get the how sort of uh, answered questions. But from what we see, it's a very strong recovery. Thank you. 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 Thank you.